ready to start. Uh, today I want to show you basically two things. The first is, okay, let's see a practical use of uh, a self-organizing map. Uh, <clears throat> and the second, um, I would like to modify the code of the previous time, so the one for the hard image algorithm, in order to work with a soft gaming algorithm and as a simple consequence also on uh, self-organizing maps. So as we have seen yesterday, they are basically the same thing. Self-organizing maps are a generalization of uh, soft gaming principle. Uh, to see how we can uh, use uh, self-organizing maps, uh, I propose uh, that we take uh, a look to this uh, website from uh, University of California at uh, Irvine, which is a repository of many sample uh, data, data collections that are used by people working on machine learning to test their algorithm. Uh, you have lots of different data sets uh, on uh, various topics. For example, the most popular data set uh, is one that uh, involves the classification of uh, uh, the iris flowers. Iris, iris, I don't know. So, in this case, uh, for example, it is a supervised learning task where uh, four different uh, features of uh, flowers are measured sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width and based on that uh, the type uh, of uh, iris, the, the, the species of iris is uh, um, provided either setosa, versicolor, or virginica this is just one example. Um, for example, one data set that uh, can be appealing to many is this one. Different kinds of wines. Uh, the idea is that uh, um, they had uh, lots of samples of different uh, wines taken from different uh, cultivars cultivars Vitigno, uh, Italiano meaning that so and they built a data set where they measured 13 different chemical properties of each sample so things that can be measured by uh, chemical tests, uh, alcohol content, malic acid content, and so on. And uh, to these 13 features, um, the, uh, the ID of, a, of one of three cultivars is appended. So the data set that you get is uh, uh, this one. You see, for every different uh, uh, sample, you have all the chemical measurements, 13 chemical measurements, and the first column, although you cannot see it because the projector doesn't work that well, is a number, can be one, two, or three, depending on which cultivar the sample comes from. The challenge of this data set is, can you train a system so that by, give, by only giving the chemical properties, you can get, you can uh, guess the right cultivar? 
So this is a so-called supervised machine learning task. It's something that we are not covering in this course because, uh, well, there's many different facets and uh, some of you already saw a lot of it uh, in uh, the machine learning course. But even unsupervised learning is covered by that course, but it's more important to us. Okay, so what I want to show you is that uh, um, let me run. Uh, okay, this program. Maybe in the future we will uh, try to work. Oh wow. Okay, it will be a challenge because. Okay, let's see. I import uh, the. Wine database. So what I'm going to do now is using this database to train a self-organizing map. You don't need to understand all the steps that I'm taking. Just uh, so there are a few samples. Okay, they sh should be around uh, 100 or so. So I prefer to limit the size of the self-organizing ma uh, map to a 4x4 four four grid. Okay, so we only have 16 cells. To do this work, I want to select all chemical properties, but not the cultivar. The cultivar should remain unknown. The idea is that uh, By seeing how self-organizing maps work, so we should get a 4x4 four four grid. Actually, you will see is it is an hexagonal grid, but it's easier to draw it like this on the blackboard, where you see similar chemical samples should fall in the same cell. Okay. The idea of clustering is that similar objects uh, fall together and that uh, nearby cells contain similar clusters. So cluster variation should uh, be smooth uh, along this table. So when I train this, so I let the self-organizing map uh, algorithm work <coughs> and I get the outcome I can have a look how it is okay you see here we have a um, <coughs> so we have four by four cells so each of these cells contains uh, some number of samples, some, a few of the samples of our table. I decided to color the cell according to the composition, to the, to the cultivar label of the samples. So the idea is that uh, if the cell is red, then most uh, of the samples that uh, fall in this cell come from cultivar 3 while cells that are green come from cultivar 1 of course you see some variations of colors because some cells contain a mix of samples probably samples that are borderline some of them are from cultivar 3 and some cultivar 2 and so on. Okay, from this uh, we can see that the features, the chemical properties of the sample actually can help us decide what cultivar the wine comes from. In fact, you see that if the chemical properties fall in this cell, 
then most probably Caldemar will be three. There are, of course, some places where uh, the cultivar is not that well uh, defined. Um, this is not the only thing that we can do with the self-organizing maps. For example, let's see, uh, okay, I can duplicate the panel. Um, for example, Here we have the same self-organized map on the left and on the right, but on the left we colored it with the cultivar. On the right I colored it with the alcohol content of the sample. By looking at this, it's easy, rather easy, to see that a high alcoholic content is, uh, um, well, does uh, uh, hint, hints to, uh, to cultivar 1, okay? If you find a high alcoholic content, then probably it comes from cultivar 1. While cultivar 2 tends to have a lower alcohol content, cultivar 3 being in the middle. Uh, and so on. Let's see another couple of examples. For example, let me color this with flavonoids uh, and uh, this with non flavonoids. Let's see. I'm trying to find some interesting property. Okay, let's see this. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, another thing that you can see by looking at uh, colored self-organizing maps uh, is that um, okay, you can find uh, distinctive properties of different cultivars in this case, but you can also find uh, maybe this is not the best example I can find, but. For example, here you can find uh, a property that is uh, shared by two of the cultivars, for example, cultivars 2 and 1 and 3, so cells that are on this side of the self-organizing map, both have a high magnesium content, while cells on the left have a lower magnesium content. So, by one of the possible user, uses of uh, self-organizing maps is also to compare the same, the same self-organizing map with different uh, cell attributes, for example, color cell coloration, cell color in this case, in order to have a visual hint at uh, what are the important properties of your data. So, so we can have two different uses. In fact. The first is the one that we saw, we spoke about yesterday. Just represent your data and uh, actually put some uh, writing, for example, in the cells that identifies the position of your data. Another possibility is this one, comparing more self-organizing maps on the same data. No, sorry. Looking at the same self-organizing map, but colored with different attributes. Okay, this is one. Um, one application of self-organizing maps. 
Uh, now, uh, <coughs> let's move to the um, code. Okay, um, so you can find that the hard thing is clustering code uh, here, okay? If you want to download it, then we have all, uh, we, we all have the same code. Okay, so here we have the code. Um, <coughs> the first uh, thing I propose is uh, let's do the necessary modifications to move from the hard k means problem to the soft k means uh, uh, algorithm. Sorry, problem. So um, Let's see, uh, if you remember, okay, we had a loop testing for many values of k, so many different numbers of clusters from 1 to 5. Um, and uh, uh, for every value of k, we repeated the hard clustering procedure until there was no change. So, as long as there was some change, we kept uh, working, we stopped otherwise. Of course, this must be changed. We... The soft clustering procedure will uh, continuously pull uh, vectors here and there. So, let's uh, say that we want to repeat uh, our uh, um, k means uh, uh, step for 100 times okay. so step becomes the variable in the for loop and I don't change it around we are not going to test uh, if anything is changed. Now, so we start the, the, the um, hard clustering procedure by deciding the cluster attribution of uh, uh, vectors. Of, of our elements. This is something that we don't want to do with the soft clustering procedure. Remember, the soft clustering procedure works like that. This. Uh, I'm going to write it here. So. The values of move are initialized in a random way and then we repeat we choose uh, 
choose a random index in uh, okay let's use the Python convention so let's start everything from zero a random between zero and m minus one so we choose one random element um, in j we take the closer uh, mu j to element di and uh, we move j by adding the value proportional to the difference between di and j. So this is what we want to do. So we have to start with random attributions of uh, values to our uh, representative vectors. So our first guess might be, for example, uh, so we have uh, in uh, NumPy random this should generate numbers between 0 and 1 uh, what I actually want uh, is a set of uh, uh, k vectors having uh, n elements each Okay, so this way we generate k different uh, uh, cluster uh, prototypes. Now, okay, this code would compute uh, the prototypes based on the cluster attributions, but we don't have any cluster attribution. Um, Okay, later we will decide uh, how to plot. So I think I can erase everything here. Well, no, it's good. No, I didn't have anything. So, at every step, we have to choose one random integer. between 0 and uh, uh, m minus 1 Next, uh, we have to find uh, the index uh, of the closest uh, vector but we already have the function that finds it Ok, closest centroid returns the index of the closest uh, move. So just call closest uh, centroid. Uh, here we need the uh, the item we are considering, the i, and uh, the set of centroids uh, where we want to find the closest one. And finally, we just need to correct, uh, to move uh, the centroid mu j. So, mu j must be increased by what quantity? Let's call it eta, then we will define it. Well, let me define it uh, now. So let's say that our value for eta will be, who knows, 0.5. Let's keep it constant now. Later we will uh, decrease it. Eta times 
D. So the element I minus centroid J. Okay, at this point, um, okay, everything will be repeated uh, a certain number of times. Of course, we want to plot the outcome. So, this plot procedure uh, needs some modifications because uh, we have uh, the set of uh, documents, of uh, our set of elements D. We have our set of, of uh, vector representatives mu, but uh, we don't have uh, any more attributions of uh, elements to clusters, so I cannot uh, pass N and C. Actually, I would like to color my elements depending on their uh, cluster attribution, so I will modify the plot procedure Okay, I remove N and C, but uh, I will compute them inside the procedure. Okay, so um, let's see. For uh, every element uh, in our original set, let uh, the cluster attribution CI be the uh, index of the closest the centroid this way, and since uh, I want uh, to count how many elements there are in every cluster, I initialize uh, my vector n as a set of m0 values. And every time I compute an association between a document and a cluster, I increment the corresponding number of elements of that cluster. So everything else should still work as it worked before. The only other change that I want to do is this, uh, just a cosmetic change. We are going to look at uh, a large number of steps, 100, maybe 1000, we shall see. So let me increase the number of digits uh, of the step in the, in the output, in, in, the, in the output file. And let's see how it works. So I save it. Well, let's see if it works. So let me run. Okay, in fact, we have some problems. Oh, I used uh, some lowercase d's here, but it's actually the ith element in my collection, which is an uppercase D, and also here. So there were at least uh, three points where I put a lowercase D. Well, of course, uh, CI is not defined. So let's let's start with uh, uh, I can either initialize this with the empty list or no, let's do something different. Here I just initialize the initialize C as uh, the list of closest centroids and 
and then I count uh, the number of cluster attributions uh, like this. Okay, um, I forgot to remove uh, the, the instruction to print uh, this uh, string, but well, actually, we don't know how long it takes. So let me do a final modification. I remove this table header because I'm not printing the quantization error anymore. And here, maybe, I can add the I want to write k and step, maybe with uh, five uh, each, and go back to the beginning of the line at the end. Okay, this way at least we know what the program is doing. Okay, the main reason why the program is so slow is that at every step it's creating a plot of the situation. So of course uh, it takes time. Uh, later we will try to do maybe thousands of iterations with one plot every 100 steps or so, just to see how it works. But for now, let's see how it works with 100 steps for each. So we have a lot of uh, okay, E O G. So this is how, for example, with one cluster, things work. So from one step to the other, you see that uh, the cluster centroid uh, is pulled uh, here and there, depending on which document is pulling it. Of course, uh, since we never decrease the value of eta, it will keep uh, being unstable. Here we're going to uh, two centroids. So now you see the situation is uh, uh, more stable. Let's go back to the first step. Okay, in this case we have the same data set, two cluster prototypes, and as you see, and of course, uh, um, at every step, uh, just one of the prototypes will move. Because every time we select one document, and we pull one prototype. So in fact, uh, in the first steps, uh, we only see the, 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 the lower prototype move. And only later, one of these documents will be selected by chance, uh, and also the other prototype uh, we we'll start moving. And now, of course, uh, every prototype will uh, keep moving inside its own cluster. Every time we choose one of these elements, this uh, prototype will be moved. Every time we choose one of these elements, this prototype will be moved. And so on for 100 steps. So let's go rapidly to 99. Okay. Next time, three prototypes, okay, one was generated here and two were generated here. Actually, this is not very good because what I expect is that, you see, this lonely prototype here will have this wool set for himself, while the two prototypes above will fight or this uh, smaller cloud. This is one of the shortcomings of writing a very simple algorithm, of course. 
what I would really like is two prototypes here that share this large cloud and one up here, of course. But okay, we cannot tell all that we want. And so on. Four prototypes work like uh, this. Uh, you see that actually this prototype is too far away to capture any element. But the problem is that I generated the elements. Uh, um, so I generated the prototype in the 0, 1 square, which is not exactly the place where the elements reside. So in fact, uh, there is, you see here there is a large sea of nothing. And uh, if a prototype is generated around here, it will never be the closer to any document, and it will remain there indefinitely. So what we can do in this case, uh, well, actually, in this case, we were lucky. Just by wasting one prototype, we get a fine clustering with the three, the three remaining prototypes. Um, and so on. Let's see what happens with... Uh, oh, you see. Actually, this prototype, by chance, has moved in this direction, probably a couple of times uh, one of these uh, documents were selected and it was pulled in this direction. So actually, a pair of documents uh, were attributed to this one. Now the problem is, will uh, one of these documents will be selected in time so that this prototype is pulled here or will rather this prototype move back here so that these elements are reconquered? Actually, we will never know because we are towards the end, 97 steps. And in fact, at the 99th step, we still are in this condition, we don't know how it will work out. Again, with the five documents we have, uh, with five prototypes, we have uh, another not so nice situation with uh, actually two prototypes that move and three prototypes that stand still. So in fact, uh, we need to uh, improve somehow the algorithm. One way to improve it is, of course, uh, changing the initial attribution, the initial uh, setting of O. Uh, rather than placing them uh, in random points uh, that more or less correspond to our data set, uh, well, let's consider another simple possibility, which is Okay, let's take k elements from our data set and we initialize the prototypes with the precise values of those documents. So we put our k prototypes where k randomly chosen elements are. Um, So let's do it. Um, let's see. Um, okay, for example, we can permute We can take a permutation. This is not the most efficient way of doing that, of course. But I want k distinct uh, integers. Okay, the problem is that. So <coughs> either I 
Uh, let's do just this, okay? We permute uh, the m integers and then <coughs> we need uh, to add uh, the document, uh, the, 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 the first k elements uh, in that permutation to move. So we can initialize move with uh, zeros. Of course, I want uh, k n dimensional vectors all equal to zero. And then for uh, i in uh, zero to k minus one, uh, move of i is assigned d of uh, the permutation of i. Okay, in this way we put uh, into the i uh, row of mu, so in the i mu vector, one random document, one distant random document. Uh, by the way, Usually in Python, this is a, um, a reference assignment. So I would actually take a reference to this uh, line and put it as a reference to move. But uh, here, move is not really a, a Python list. It's a, a, an n-dimensional array as it's defined by loopy. And since I already have initialized it, uh, I'm actually copying the elements. So the elements of this vector are copied into this vector. At least I hope it is so. But we can test it uh, quite easily. For example, let's do this just to be sure. Uh, here, for at every step, uh, I print uh, this one, d of term of 0 to be sure that uh, even though I modify let's print, let's also print uh, move of zero and we should find uh, that uh, move of zero is modified from time to time while d of perm of zero is never modified let's do this check to be sure Uh, module object has no attribute permutation. Ah, of course, permutation is uh, a, a, an attribute of random, not by random permutation. Let's stop it. Okay, so you see that. Uh, one line every two remains the same while so mu zero is different from d of zero of the term of zero so we are actually copying the values they are not referring to the same vector now let's go back here okay now we are initializing mu with uh, some documents. Let's wait for the program to complete and let's see what happens. So, you see, at least uh, in the initial steps, uh, we are quite sure that every um, every prototype will have at least uh, one element for itself. Because it has distance zero with one of the elements. Okay, of course, what we are seeing here is already after the first computation, so it already has moved. Of course, uh, for k equal to one, there is very little to see. For k equal to two, 
of the MPC. I'm wondering why this element. Actually, I cannot see. Ah, okay. The other problem is that I'm plotting the centroids before the other uh, the other data sets. So it is now covered by something. Uh, I know that you are going to lose some time, but it's important that we visualize things well. So, let me do one thing. First, uh, uh, we remove uh, the key. I don't want to see any writing. Second, I want to, I still want to plot uh, the uh, prototypes as a first object because I want, always want to see them with the same symbol while the other symbols can vary but uh, I, we can put, a, I don't know, an exaggerated point size so that they become larger I'm just going to do the first steps well, maybe a little too large, but um, that's fine. We all only have to see the center of the cross. So, okay. So now I run this from the beginning to the end. Now, after the relatively useless k equal to 1, I might as well remove k equal to 1 from the program. Okay, now we can see how it works. So the two centroids are here, and well, actually. Uh, you see, this range goes from is uh, one, while this range is 0.8. So actually, you are seeing a stretched version of this uh, diagram. It should be much. Uh, it should be shrinked in the x direction. So, in fact, uh, if you shrink it the y-axis becomes more important and this element, uh, for some reason, becomes closer to this uh, prototype. Anyway, you see at the end, one of these elements pulled this prototype up here. This prototype conquers most of this Uh, set and finally each moves uh, to its own uh, cluster. Excuse me. This, the first point of the green and let's say cluster should be on to an existing point. So you're saying in step one, in step zero? Step zero, yes. Yes, actually step zero is plotted when the first move has already been done. So these clusters uh, has already been moved. Every time you run it, it should be different, right? Uh, what says? If you run the program again. I, I set uh, a random seed to have the same results every time. Oh, okay, I see. Yes. Uh, just uh, to, be, to have a familiar setting, of course. Let's see what happens with the three. Oh, 
well, in this case, the three uh, objects were all on the same side. But anyway, one of them uh, should be forced uh, to migrate here uh, quite uh, rapidly because you see how it works. And in fact, uh, ju just in the first, uh, in, actually in the second step, uh, we are assisting to this migration and finally everything works. Of course, uh, we were lucky. It might as well have been that one centroid was here and the two other centroids were here, as in the previous case. Okay, four clusters. Nothing new. Five clusters again. Nothing new. Okay. Now, as a first modification, let's see what happens if uh, we increase the number of uh, uh, of row of, of uh, clouds. Let's say here I generated just three clouds of points. Let's say that um, my final purpose is to have a 3x3 three three self-organizing map. So let's say that we want 9 clouds of points. Uh, I don't want to deal with 900 points. Uh, let's say that uh, we divide this by 3, more or less 30. So that we have, we have approximately the same number of points we had before. Nine clouds with 30 elements each. Let's remain in two dimensions. Another modification here. Okay, I don't want to test uh, for all values of k. Let's say that uh, I want to have k equal to 9, okay? Suppose that we are lucky, we already decided that we have 9 different clusters. So that we spare some iteration and everything should work as before. Uh, second, okay. Here uh, we are actually plotting uh, things as they are after the first step. So I would like to put another plotting instruction here with step equal to zero and here maybe I run step from one to one hundred. Okay, so the first plot will be actually be the initial situation. Let's see what happens. In this case, we have nine prototypes which are competing on nine clouds of points. Of course, nine clouds of points, but some of them will overlap, of course, so I don't expect to see nine spots in the graph. I expect to see a quite confused situation. Well, this is not... Uh, oh, I forgot to delete the previous values, so actually I only want to... see the ones for key equal to zero 0,9. Okay. This is the initial situation. Every centroid, every cluster representative is precisely placed at one document's uh, coordinate. 
and then while we proceed, uh, one of them will be pulled here and there, and uh, the overall effect will be to balance somehow their position according to the, the, the position of the centroids. Actually, you see, we don't see it that much. Uh, we don't see much uh, uh, information here. So now, to improve things, uh, maybe I can uh, reduce uh, the covariance of each cloud so that the points are more uh, centralized. Let's say I put it to point zero zero one instead of zero zero five. Maybe it's too small, but let's see what happens. This time I remove all the figures. Okay, so now everything is more concentrated. Of course, not all uh, clouds uh, have uh, immediately one of the prototypes because they are attributed randomly. But uh, as you see, as time goes by, most uh, clouds of points will get their own cluster. The only exception here is probably this one which is overcrowded with respect to this one which is probably should probably no actually there are probably two clouds here because these are more than 30 points anyway you see that things work more or less as Desired. Everything has been set. Oh, by the way, you see what happened here? Uh, what happened? I don't understand very well that movement from here to here. You're running from the zero to ninety-nine units. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was quite at the beginning. Okay, so the algorithm is probably correct. Um, now we can try now to see what happens if we uh, link our um, prototypes together as in a self-organizing map. So we can see what happens if we have one of the elements pull the others. Of course this requires uh, a few more modifications of the code. The main modification is this. Uh, well, let's do. The, rather than speaking of the number of clouds of points, uh, let's say, just to be general, let's set a number of rows and a number of uh, columns. And uh, the number of clouds, of course, will be the product of the two. Okay, so we want a 3 by 3 um, self organizing map. Now, here we can uh, define 
our function, uh, okay, yesterday I symbolized it with uh, theta. This function will be given two um, prototype indices and will say if uh, how much, how close they are to each other. So let's say the indices are i and j. And well, simply if i is equal to j, then we want to return one. Okay. If the i and j refer to the same prototype, then of course it. The, the, the effect, the movement should be maximized. Second, um, okay, we need to consider separately rows and columns of the two uh, prototypes. So the row of prototype i is actually index i modulo the number of columns. Please correct me if I am wrong. In fact, the row is i divided by the number of columns. And uh, the column corresponding to index i is uh, i modulo the number of columns. OK, so what I'm doing now is I take my vectors move, I put them on a grid where uh, indices go like this. And what I, okay. Um, so let's say that I want theta to return one if the two indices are equal. 0.5 if the two indices uh, are on the four neighbors, first neighbors, and zero in the other cases. So let's take uh, the row and columns uh, of the two. Then, if, uh, okay, uh, Ri is equal to Rj, so if the two elements are in the same row and their column differs by 1, so Ci is uh, Cj uh, minus 1 or Ci is equal to Cj plus 1, meaning the element i is on one of the two sides, at the left or, or at the right of the element j. This is one case. Uh, the other case is, uh, well, we just complement rows and columns. So, or the two elements are in the, on the same column and their rows differ by one, well, in that case we return 0.5. In all other cases we return 0. Okay, this is our theta function. Let's move to the main program. And we have to change this. Now, here I computed the closest centroid. Fine. But now the modification must be uh, propagated to all uh, prototypes. So I need uh, four... Uh, um, L in the range of prototypes, so from 0 to k minus 1, mu of L must be increased by the same as before, 
So must be mu L must be moved towards the I by an amount which is proportional to theta and proportional to theta of well the let's see how prototype L so the cell L is close to cell uh, J and so this should be all the changes that we need to work let's see how it works now uh, close this So now, actually, the only effect that we should see is that uh, um, more than one prototype moves uh, at the same time. So see, for example, from step zero to step one, oh, sorry, okay, we have uh, at least uh, three prototypes uh, two here and one here that are pulled who knows where let's see uh, towards one of these documents anyway and so on actually you see things tend to move a little too much around but anyway uh, what we don't see here is the actual order of our centroids we don't know if they are uh, well stretched or so what I propose is uh, to draw a grid among uh, these uh, centroids the idea is that you see centroid so the grid should join centroids in this pattern so that we can actually see how they are ordered in this drawing So we just need to add something to the plot procedure. Here we already write the move uh, vector. Okay, let's create uh, one more uh, vector of uh, elements. In this case I want to draw lines between coordinates. In order to draw lines between coordinates with GNU plot, uh, well, we can see how to do it. So, let's create a new file, uh, grid.cord, for example. Because at the end we also want to close it. And in the middle, What I want to do is draw um, some horizontal, well, they won't be horizontal to that, they will be between the positions of the centroids. So, um, you see, the idea is that. If uh, this is uh, centroid 0 and this is centroid 1, I want to pull a line from here to here. And the same from centroid 1 to centroid 2, and also from centroid 0 to centroid uh, 3, and so on, in order to reproduce this grid, but uh, 
displaced uh, as uh, this cluster R. So for every uh, row, which are n rows, I want to draw a line <laughs> Let's consider the, or the horizontal lines first I just want to write Okay, to draw a line I have to write two lines of values Like this. Oh no. I just have to. Okay, I just write a couple of values closed by a new line. Uh, move of uh, I. Okay. I times and columns plus j and the two coordinates are 0 and the same with the f1 Okay, then every row should be closed by an additional new line to separate it from the other ones. Next, I want to do the same for columns. So for every column, uh, that's always called J, the columns. I the rows and uh, probably everything remains like this. Okay, and here after plotting the centroid, I also want to plot uh, the corresponding grid. with the lines let's see the outcome I'm not expecting that much but okay the first attribution is random, so the grid uh, is completely mixed up. Let's see if uh, the algorithm is able to untangle it. Well, actually, somehow it does, you see. In the final steps, uh, Last thing I can see here. But anyway, you see that the fact of, uh, you see, every time I pull this uh, prototype, I also pull this and this. The effect uh, of pulling together them is uh, to actually untangle the net. In fact, at the beginning, it's like having, consider this a, who knows, a fishing net, okay? It is completely tangled, but by pulling its uh, nodes, 
and having every node pull its nearby nodes, the net starts to untangle. So that at the end you get, well, if this were the end, you would get the effect that you were liking, were uh, looking for. So not only, you see, here actually centroids are pulled uh, too much. So for example, this uh, prototype would like to be here, but it's pulled by this centroid, so it's moved too much. But anyway, these two centroids uh, actually refer to close uh, uh, clouds, to clouds that are near each other. While this centroid and this centroid that uh, belong to two cells that are far away actually belong to clusters that are far away from each other. Of course, here we need a very careful balance between the different uh, um, the different constants that we are using. In fact, uh, as you see, using an eta value that remains always the same is not fine because clusters still continue jumping here and there. And also, using the same values for theta is bad because uh, this uh, centroid will never go to its own cluster, but it always remains uh, close to its uh, neighbors. It's pulled by the <laughs> For example, let's see what happens if uh, we uh, reduce eta from step to step. Let's work with uh, a small reduction. So, for example, here at every step, I multiply eta by 0.99. And just see, uh, just to have uh, an idea of what happens. Let's write the value of eta on the screen. Um, okay, uh, let's do just another step here. Uh, I only put a new line at the end so that we can see the value, the final value of eta. Okay, so you see, eta actually is reduced, uh, doesn't, I'm multiplying it uh, by something very close to 1, so it reduces slowly. Let's see what is the effect on uh, our system. See, in this case, untangling doesn't work as uh, well as before. While uh, the net has been somehow untangled with respect to the beginning, still it's uh, uh, still like folded in two. This is the central point. This line should be on this side. Anyway, of course, we don't have much control of that. And the other effect is that, you see, the crosses tend to be concentrated at the center because they pull each other rather than distributed along. So, the second modification that I propose is this. Let's introduce, well, no, let's consider uh, well, eta itself, and let's 
C. Okay, when we compute theta, so here, in this case we don't return pot 5, but we return a decreasing value, and maybe eta itself. So, in a sense, the elasticity of these uh, links uh, increases. At the beginning they are very rigid. Every time you pull one, you also pull its neighbors. Towards the end, the effect will be much lower, and uh, a strong pull on one will result in a very weak pull on the neighbors because this eta is reducing. Of course, I have to pass it as parameter. Uh, here, and of course also when I call theta. Okay, so the effect of the self-organizing map is reduced as time proceeds. Of course it's not clear if this will result in a good outcome or not. So what happens here is that we have some untangling and as, uh, sorry, Okay, probably I should have kept uh, the previous uh, figures, but what we get is that some of the centroids are actually, so the, the grid is much more spread among uh, the different uh, uh, clouds of points. Okay, so, I mean, there are many different uh, parameters that we can play with. For example, what we can do actually is this. Suppose that we call no. What happens if Rather than uh, returning eta here, we return eta squared. In this case, we have that eta is reduced um, from, uh, from one step to the other. But the effect of pulling the neighbors is reduced much more. Okay, because um, the square of eta goes from one quarter to almost zero towards the end. In fact, we can also write it here. Okay, so in this case we have, this is the, in a sense, the pulling strength of one item towards the closest uh, representative. The second is the pull towards uh, its uh, neighbors, which is much lower towards the end. Let's see what it means uh, in this case. Well. As you see, the network is uh, even more tangled, which uh, of course could be expected because uh, we have uh, um, a much lower pool on the neighbors. And we still 
have some problems in really spreading it around. So, what I suggest that you could do if you find uh, time, if you are curious about this, is uh, okay to um, try to play with this code and try to see what happens if you change the different parameters. Um, you see, one of the explanations of uh, um, the self-organizing maps, uh, you can find it uh, as usual on Wikipedia. So if you find the self-organizing map. So here you get a description which is somehow similar to what we saw. Okay, here for example you can see a, an analysis of the voting patterns in the uh, US Congress. Okay, this is A description of what uh, should happen uh, in uh, this is the well yes one of the description of what should ideally happen when one node of the grid is pulled towards one data all of the grid should be somehow encouraged to go in that direction direction starting from the first neighbors so that at the end the prototypes, the prototype network, is well spread on the data set. This, of course, is an ideal situation. This is not what happens in most cases. It's easy for the network to remain tangled somehow. But, again, uh, there is no easy way to uh, adjust these problems. Anyway, this page contains uh, a description of the learning algorithm which is, well, more or less the same uh, that I gave you yesterday with different symbols actually, but I don't think that's a problem for you, so I'm going to link this page uh, uh, among the, the things that you should read in order to say that, okay, you know the topic. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's all for today. I don't know if you have any questions or, or suggestions. Okay, so that's all. Out.